Hey everybody, this is Brant. Thanks for joining me. So last weekend's video, I said that I thought the market was a little bit too oversold, a little bit too bearish. Now that doesn't mean that I think the market is about ready to turn around and go into a bull market. But if you're in an uptrend, you have ups and you have downs. If you're in a downtrend, you have ups, you have downs. If you're in a sideways trend, you have ups and downs. We had four weeks of downs. Breath, market breath was very oversold. Sentiment was very bearish. So I was looking for a little bounce this week. We got a little bounce this week. Um, what I said in last weekend's video was that for stocks to gain any traction on the upside, bond yields are going to have to come down. Now, what's interesting is by the time I posted this video, I don't think I knew about it when I was recording it, but by the time it came out and posted, all the events in Israel had happened last weekend. So it was people freaking out like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with the stock market on Monday morning? A lot of times things that happen in the stock market, the way stock market reacts doesn't make rational sense. A lot of times it's just contrary to what you think should happen. But ironically, it was due to the events in Israel last weekend that there was a flight to safety into treasuries. The treasury market was closed on Monday for Columbus Day holiday, but treasury futures were open. There was a flight to safety into treasuries, buying treasuries, which sent yields lower, which sent stocks higher. This is something I'm going to share with you. If you are a trader and you don't know about this, you have to know about this. If you are an investor that's even somewhat active, you know, you're not like a 10 year buy and hold guy, but you're a little bit active. You've got to know about this. The biggest driving factor for stocks since March of last year has been an inverse correlation with yields, which is exactly why I said last weekend that for the market to rally, yields are going to have to come down. I'm going to show you an example of this from this week. So what you're looking at is a seven minute chart. Here's Sunday. This is when I think everything went down in Israel. Here's the markets open on Monday. The green and red candles are S&P futures. The white line is 10 year treasury futures. Remember that yields move opposite treasury prices. So treasuries rallying means yields come down. So what happened Sunday, as soon as the bond market opened, flight to safety bid right there. That sent yields down, that sent stocks up. So we see that into Monday. Look how close this correlation is between bonds and stocks. Now, I have to tell you that this is not normal. This has been in effect since March of last year when the Fed started hiking rates. Usually stocks and bonds are not highly correlated. So if you've ever had an art and IRA and the guy comes into your work and says, well, you know, do you want to be aggressive or do you want to be a little bit more cautious? It depends on your age. If you're younger, you want to be more aggressive. And they generally have these plans where it's like a 60-40 stock to bond split or a 40 to 60 stock to bond split. So if you're more aggressive, they'll do 60, 40 uh, favoring stocks. If you want to, if you're closer to retirement, they might do 40 to 60. So the two are not highly correlated generally, but that has not been the case since March of last year. They've been highly, highly correlated. And any good money manager uh, or hedge fund manager knows that there are basically four inputs that go into your portfolio makeup and how you want to position it. Is growth, economic growth moving up or moving down? Is inflation moving up or moving down? And between those four conditions, you are between those, uh, between growth up and down and inflation up and down, you have four different variables. So if you're early in the economic cycle and growth and inflation are both picking up, right? You're in a new economic cycle, new bull market. The stocks that you want to own are generally going to be something like, you know, basic materials, industrials. You might see inflation come down a little bit with growth pick up and then everybody's going to pile into tech stocks. And then you might see growth and inflation come down and then everybody's going to move into the counter cyclicals, which are going to be your bond proxy sectors like utilities, consumer staples, stuff like that. And if it's a good portfolio manager, they're not just looking at what those two factors are doing, growth like, you know, GDP, inflation, the CPI report. They're looking at how they're moving on a year over year basis and which way they're headed into one of those four quadrants. OK, so what I'm sharing with you right now is a very unusual situation. 
keep that in mind. Don't expect it to go on forever. I expect that it probably changes when the market stops focusing so much on inflation and what the Fed's going to do and starts focusing more on, oh my gosh, we're in an economic recession, and then yields will start reflecting that economic recession or slower growth. But again, the point is, as soon as futures open Sunday, we get a flight to safety into treasuries because of what happened in Israel. That brings down bond yields. That sends stocks higher. Over here on Thursday, we got a hot CPI report, consumer price index, hot inflation, right? And then we had, uh, I think it was a three-year treasury auction over here on Tuesday, a 10-year on Wednesday, and a 30-year on Thursday. They were all horrible, and Thursday's was dismal. So not only did CPI send treasuries down and yields higher, which sent stocks down, but also that very, very weak treasury auction at 1 p.m., sent yields higher and sent stocks lower. So that's what you see here at the end of the week. But if you're a trader, you're active in the markets and you don't know about this, you are trading with one or two hands tied behind your back because this is the most influential factor right now moving the stock market. So let's go on and take a look at the averages for the week. Here we have the S&P 500 and this is a head and shoulders pattern. I know some people disagree with me, and, you know, if you just look at the price action alone, you could say, well, it could be anything, right? Head and shoulders patterns are exceptionally rare, in my opinion. Real true ones, they have to be confirmed by volume. This one is perfectly confirmed by volume, and they are everywhere. They're in every major index. They're in most of the most important influential S&P sectors. So if you just had one, it would be like, eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. But they're everywhere. In any case... Neckline, what I was saying last week is when we get about halfway to the measured move, which we did right here in the S&P at 42.20, we very often either get a consolidation or a correction, very often a back test of this neckline like we see here. So the S&P was up just shy of a half a percent on the week, but a lot of that is because of losing ground Thursday and Friday. Let me go to a 15-minute chart. We'll take a closer look. So here we are, and here we are coming into this week over here, a nice bounce into that neckline, a little brief stop there. And this started to look like it was going to be a bullish consolidation. Then we got a little bit weaker tone Thursday and Friday over here into the end of the week. So I'm not quite sure what it is. I still want to give it the benefit of the doubt of it being a bullish consolidation, but it's very sloppy. And what I've been saying to subscribers for three or four weeks is just bulls have no conviction here. It's like they've been past the ball and they're fumbling it. They just do not want to step up. Here is the Dow on a two-hour chart. Another head and shoulders pattern, another neckline, another bear flag, another break. Down towards the halfway point of the measured move, a perfect, perfect back test of the neckline. So former support once broken often becomes resistance. Look at this resistance. So it was one of the best performing averages up eight tenths of a percent on the week. Again, it was up higher, but lost some ground into the end of the week. If we take a look at a 30 minute chart of this, there is a potential here. Let me get a drawing tool. There is a potential of this being, oh, sorry, my drawing is horrible here a small inverse head and shoulder base, okay? So that would be the left shoulder, this would be the head, this would be the right shoulder, this would be the neckline. Volume is not great for confirmation here, not like the head and shoulders top is, um, but the 3C chart is more interesting here. Dow has one of the best 3C charts right now, I don't know why, but in any case, if that were uh, the case, then your measured move would basically be from this neckline over here, down to the bottom, your percentage, and you would add that onto the breakout here. Taking a little bit of a closer look, again, we see this kind of rally in the beginning of the week and then hitting that neckline. You can see the resistance there in price. And it started to look like a bull flag over here. Then things got messy Thursday with the CPI report and the bunk really dismal 30-year treasury auction. Prices came down sharply and it kind of screwed up what was looking like a nice little bull flag over here. Uh, still want to give it the benefit of the doubt, but it is sloppy and the conviction, again, amongst buyers or the bulls is very low. 
here is the NASDAQ 100 on a two hour time frame. Again, another head and shoulders, but it's been lingering around this neckline. Why? Because mega caps have been the only game in town in 2023 and they're still propping up the NASDAQ. There's some interesting things here. NASDAQ was only up uh, just a little bit over a tenth of a percent on the week. As you can see, it gave back some gains into the end of the week. What's interesting, if we look at a 30 minute chart, we're going to look at this little area right here around that neckline. Let me get to a 30 minute chart. This to me looks like a small inverse head and shoulders again. Here would be the left shoulder, the head, the right shoulder, and the neckline at 14,900, which I talked about in last weekend's video. Now, again, volume confirmation is not great, but it's a small pattern. It's not like a major top like we just saw on the larger pattern. And 3C showed buying here and here, which it should for that kind of pattern. The measured move for this was right up here at 15.385. It was, I think, a 3.2% measured move, and it missed it by just one third of a percent so it's almost like close enough and the most probable thing to happen after you hit a measured move is either you get a consolidation like a bull flag or something or you get a correction this is a price correction so this actually i think was very valid did what it was expected to do now we are going to go to small caps i'm going to use iwm and here we go with a two hour chart and another head and shoulders pattern. This happens to be the measured move. So small caps actually had almost a 9% measured move and they fell about 1.7% short of it. So they came really, really darn close to hitting that measured move before bouncing a little bit this past week. So small caps, let me just say, are the ugliest right now down 1.6% for the week, but they were up earlier in the week pretty good. If you look at the price trend since it topped over here at the top of the head and shoulders, it is what I would call like a sub-intermediate downtrend. So it is a trend of lower highs, right? And lower lows. Lower highs, lower lows. That is the definition of a downtrend. This week's bounce or rally was to a lower high. We haven't quite made a lower low yet, but this is a bearish sub-intermediate downtrend. It is one of the uglier ones in the market. And I'm gonna flip you over to a daily chart. So this is a daily chart of IWM. I'm gonna put on my trend line for that head and shoulders. Actually, let me take it off for a second. You have the 50 day and the 200 day in blue. That's a death cross right there. And if I turn on my trend line, it's right at the neckline of that head and shoulder. So isn't that ironic happening right there? A couple other things I want to point out on volume. So if we look specifically at this week over here, what you see is this rally here on lighter volume and the sell off over here, the volume is picking up. That is bearish. That is what you expect to see in a head and shoulders. That's what you expect to see in a downtrend. That's what you expect to see in a bearish market. So as of Friday's close, small caps are now down year to date by 2.35%. They've joined the S&P Equal Weight Index, which is down three quarters of a percent year to date. The benchmark cap weighted S&P 500 is up 12.7% year to date. That reflects all of the weight of the mega caps that have been doing all the heavy lifting. So small caps have no exposure. They're down year to date. The equal weight S&P index takes that weight from mega caps out. It is down year to date. So like I said last weekend, the mega caps are still the only game in town, which makes them important to watch. And we'll get to that in a minute. So here we are back at hourly chart of small caps IWM. What I always say is regional banks have an exceptional amount of influence in small caps. And if you look at regional banks, what is this? I mean, bear flag after bear flag after bear flag after bear flag, which was another one this week that broke down. So you can see why small caps are not doing well. These regional banks are just really, really influential. And one other thing I wanna show you why we're on the subject, when you look at these regional banks, there is something going on here. There's stress in this market. This is a chart from the St. Louis Fed. It is the Bank Term Funding Program, or BTFP, which they, um, it's basically an emergency program. They started last March when all the regional banks, like S uh, Silicon Valley Bank and all those started to fail. So they 
instituted this bank term funding program to pump liquidity into those. So this past week, we had a, a jump to $109 billion for this uh, facility, which is a new record high, adding $1.2 billion this week, up the most since July. So something is going on here with these regional banks or these smaller banks that looks troubling. Another thing that affects small caps a lot is my most shorted index. Okay, it's an index, equal weighted index of stocks that have the highest short interest. So what you're looking at is a two minute chart of the S&P 500, and this is my most shorted index in white. So you can see as we come into the week here, short squeeze, short squeeze, then we get the really weak, uh, our hot PPI inflation, hot CPI inflation, and then the weak treasury auctions. And you can see short sellers just really step it up into the end of the week. There's something else going on with that with the weekend. But let me clear this chart real quick and then I'm gonna show you something else. So take a good look at that, how the uh, most shorted index looks compared to the S&P 500. It's kind of leading lower at the end of the week. Now I'm gonna change the comparison symbol to small caps. They track nearly tick for tick. So when we do get a short squeeze like we did over here, it benefits small caps the most. When shorts start pressing those positions in the most shorted stocks, it tends to hit small caps the most. So they were up pretty decent early in the week and then just gave it all back to the end of the week. Volatility, very interesting. So VIX was up 10.75% on the week, but it was up 15.75% on Friday alone. So all the gains from VIX were from Friday. And this is with the S&P just down a half a percent on Friday. This is something going into the weekend I'm gonna talk about. It has to do with Israel. VIX typically tracks kind of opposite of the S&P 500. It's more sporadic. It doesn't trend as much, but over short periods, it tracks opposite. So I've inverted S&P 500's price and overlaid VIX, and you can see how they kind of track together a little bit. So as the S&P is hitting a low, remember this is an inverted price chart, and you see VIX showing relative weakness. This typically means you know, you're going to get a bounce off that low. But here we come into the uh, week over here, and look at Friday. Look what is happening, VIX, absolute major, major relative strength, very, very unusual. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but I just wanted to point that out. So while VIX was up 15.75% on the week, VVIX, which tends to lead VIX's relative performance, was up even more, 18.6%. So a lot of fear, a lot of hedging of downside risk going into the weekend on Friday. For my subscribers, you know I've been talking about very low conviction among the bulls for a long time now, weeks, and we saw it this week. I'm going to show it to you on 3C charts real quick. So here we're looking at a two-minute chart of the SPY, the ETF for the S&P 500, and the orange indicator is my proprietary money flow indicator, 3C. When it's tracking like this with price, it's confirming. Okay, so it's saying what you see is kind of what you get. But over here where we see price making a new low and 3C is making a higher low, that's a relative positive divergence. That means there's some light buying in this area. That was also the halfway point of the measured move for S&P 500 at 42.20. And we get a bounce into this week. Typically when we see something like this, it's a relative negative divergence. And that means usually we're gonna move into like a consolidation phase, but it got really weak on Thursday over here with that CPI print and the really horrible, dismal 30-year auction. But it's not terrible, terrible, but what it does show is really a lack of conviction. So usually if we were gonna move into a consolidation phase like this, you would start to see 3C improve as that consolidation uh, develops a little bit more and it would start leading higher if it's a bullish consolidation. But that's not really what we see at all. Here's QQQ, you can see a negative divergence here into um, this little price high, got the wrong color marker again, sorry about that. Negative divergence there, confirmation over here. This would be the head of that small inverse uh, head and shoulders I talked about. There's a positive divergence there. Here we come rallying into the week and what is happening? They are selling into that price strength in QQQ. Remember NASDAQ fell just a third of a percent shy of an over 3% measured upside move from this little base. So close enough, but they were selling into it. 
And that is the beauty of 3C because it has the power to contradict price and it is showing us what's going on beneath the price surface. Here's a two minute chart of IWM. Remember, this was just the ugliest, almost hit the full downside measured move from its head and shoulders, but it does have a positive divergence there, rallies into it, and guess what? It is sold, sold, sold into that price strength. So, ugly chart there. And remember I talked about the Dow and the potential that maybe the Dow has like a small inverse head and shoulders base to the volume's not quite right, but to give you some kind of track on it, that would be the left shoulder, this would be the head, this would be the rally up to the neckline, this would be the right shoulder, back up to the neckline. The actual neckline of the head and shoulders top would be also the neckline of, <laughs> interesting, the little inverse head and shoulders base. So volume is not great for the confirmation of this and it really should be. So it, if it is, it's a weak pattern. But what I wanna show you is one of the most interesting 3C charts of the averages. And that is the Dow's ETF DIA. Pull up my drawing tool again. And as you can see, this would be the right shoulder here. And that's when 3C starts improving. This would be the head. 3C is improving more. This would be the right shoulder area. 3C is improving more. So in my opinion, based on the 3C chart alone and the price pattern, but not the volume, which is absolutely essential, this would probably be um, the most constructive little pattern that we have going on right now. I don't really know why in the Dow. I, I don't really see what would be driving the Dow over, um, say, you know, small caps, which are totally, totally oversold, or NASDAQ, which has got the mega caps. Dow just doesn't have that support from the mega caps. It's a price weighted index, not cap weighted. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's got the best looking 3C chart here right now. Not a fantastic one, but suggests maybe there's a small little base going on there. We're going to look at a few more 3C charts because what have I been saying? December of last year, we saw the mega caps being sold heavy tax loss selling into the end of the year. They were the most hated stocks of 2022 because of inflation, higher rates, the Fed hiking, all that. But in December of 2022, when they were just ugly tax selling, we saw accumulation. We saw people, not people, but institutional money buying that selling, buying those cheaper prices. And mega cap since then coming into 2023 have been the absolute best performer by far. In June, we saw the first hints of distribution, institutional distribution in mega caps. First saw it in Apple. Shortly after, we're breaking trends. Then we're putting in head and shoulders tops. Then we're seeing some of those tops break down. All that started with distribution signs in June. So we're gonna look at the mega caps again. This is not across the board, but this is quite a few of them. Here's Meta, or what was formerly Facebook. Remember the week before last, I said mega caps had really outperformed the S&P equal weight index, I think by 370 basis points, which is huge for the week. So this gain that they came into this week with, guess what? Somebody's been selling into those higher prices. We can see it right here in Meta. Here's the same kind of gain that move in Google or Alphabet. And guess what? Somebody's selling into that. So you see 3C negatively diverging into that gain. A little bit better performance into the very end of the week here. But overall, we're seeing institutional money taking the opportunity of higher prices to sell into. They have huge positions. They cannot just dump them. If they do um, at just market, they would crash the stock price. So what they do is feed out a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and they sell into strength until they're done. That's why tops are always a process, not an event. A crash is an event, but a top is a process. So it's a process of distribution because they're huge positions. Here is Apple. You can even see the huge positive divergence in 3C right here that kicked off this whole move. And as we come into uh, the highs over here, what you can see is some selling into those highs. It's not quite as um, prolific as Meta or Alphabet, but it's there in Apple as well. And Apple was the one that showed it to us first in June of this year. And then if we just take a look at the mega cap index, again, we see price lows over here. Somebody buying those lows. Remember I said that 
The mega caps outperformed that prior week by almost 4%. And then uh, into that price strength, they're selling into it. So again, we're seeing them take the opportunity where they can find the opportunity and sell into price strength to lighten up on those positions again. This is not as bad or as consistent of a trend as what we saw in June. It looks to me like it's just getting started or where they have the opportunity. You know, this is the first time in a couple of weeks or almost a month that they've had the opportunity to sell into strength. And when they get it, they are selling into it. They don't want to kill the rally early on right here before it's broken out. But once it does, they are starting to sell into it. I don't have a really strong conviction about next week like I did last week when I said, look, I think the market's just too oversold and it's time for like a little correction, a bounce, consolidation, something to work off those oversold and very bearish sentiment conditions after four straight weeks being down. It's going to depend a lot, in my opinion, on what happens in Israel and Gaza this weekend. So you might know that Israel dropped a bunch of uh, pamphlets from the air in Gaza City, said you have 24 hours to evacuate to the south. It seems like that Israel, and as I'm recording this, I haven't even looked at the news, so I don't know. But it seems like Israel is going after Hamas in Gaza City. Supposedly Hamas is holed up in tunnels beneath houses and buildings, and they wanna get civilians out of there before they go after them. So that looks like something that may happen this weekend. And we just saw massive, massive flight to safety on Friday. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Some of the assets that we saw, gold had a major safe haven bid on Friday. Treasury's got a bid, VIX. I just talked about VIX, the huge relative strength on Friday. Just Friday alone made up the whole week for VIX. So somebody hedging downside risk there. A dollar, so war premium in crude oil. I think crude oil was up something like 5% on the week. That's a risk premium or a war premium on crude. 5.8% gain um, Friday heading into the, uh, to the weekend. So what happens next week is largely going to depend, in my opinion, on what happens over this weekend with the war. And I'm usually not really, you know, one to say, oh, you know, war is going to make a whole lot of difference in the market because the market really doesn't care unless it's going to affect certain things. So say uh, Israel invades Gaza, boots on the ground, and they bomb everything out. And then Hezbollah comes and opens a second front to Israel's north coming out of Lebanon. And then maybe crude supplies all get disrupted and crude prices spike and then inflation spikes. Now the market will worry about that. And I don't mean to sound cruel or callous, like, well, the market really doesn't care, you know, what happens in Gaza as long as it doesn't affect the price of oil. But that's kind of, you know, the truth. Like I said, gold, right? Up over 5% on the week. Gold is a traditional safe haven. So it was bid with bonds. And I'm gonna show you real quick. So what you are looking at is a one hour chart of gold futures in the candlesticks and this white line is 10 year treasury futures. I said that stocks have had a strong inverse correlation with yields or a positive correlation with treasuries. Same thing for gold. So you can see over here, the 10 year treasury future leading gold lower right over here. It's doing that. Otherwise they're tracking pretty consistently together. We come into this week, both of them are bid up on a flight to safety, but Friday, look at this massive, massive move in gold futures Friday and on huge volume. That is a flight to safety bid in gold. Heading into the weekend, a lot of nervousness. I wanna show you one other chart real quick. This is a seven minute chart of the US dollar index, okay? And here's Sunday, so here's, you know, basically when the market opened. So the first thing that happened when futures opened Sunday was the dollar got a safe haven bid, right? Because of what happened over the weekend, kind of drops down. And then what happens over here Thursday, that is the hot CPI report. Sends the dollar soaring, and then we get the weak 30-year treasury, which sends yield soaring, sends the dollar soaring. Remember I said both 
Treasury yields and the dollar have had a very strong inverse correlation with stocks, with gold. And then into the end of the week Friday, we see another safe haven bid into the U.S. dollar. Here's WTI crude futures. Again, seven-minute chart. What happens Sunday as soon as futures open because of what happened in Israel? Risk premium, war premium built up. Things kind of calm down. But then Israel drops those flyers about this time. So the overnight session are very early, early morning hours before Friday's cash open. And again, what do we see? We see crude oil soaring. That is a war risk premium being priced in going into this uncertain weekend. Since at this point right here, this is when Israel was dropping all those leaflets into Gaza City, saying you have 24 hours to evacuate south. There's this old market maxim, and it sounds horrible, but it's just the truth of the market. And what the market maxim is, is when the missiles fly, it's time to buy. If you are a subscriber of mine, you were with me last year, right before Russia invaded Ukraine. I went over this concept a lot. And what happened was the market was selling off. The market did not like it when Russia was building up its forces along the border with Ukraine. But as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine, the market rallied. So when the missiles fly, it's time to buy. It has nothing to do with what you might expect, like, oh, well, defense stocks are going to do well, which we saw a lot of that early in the week. What it has to do with is the market hates, more than anything, uncertainty. And in the build up to war, before it's actually happened, like Friday over here when these flyers were dropped, but we haven't uh, seen Israel invade Gaza, that is massive uncertainty. The market does not like that. When it actually happens, the uncertainty is off the table. That's why you have that phrase, when the missiles fly, it's time to buy, because uncertainty is no longer dominating the market. If you don't believe me, go look at last year, right before Russia invaded Ukraine. Look at the stock chart. Look what happened after they invaded Ukraine. Rally. So my guess would be, you know, from what I'm seeing and from what I've read, I'm not a geopolitical analyst, it seems like Israel is going to put boots on the ground in Gaza City. If that goes off, okay, which means Hezbollah doesn't invade from the north and Iran doesn't do something wacky, then maybe on Monday, you know, volatility will come down and we'll see some of these flight to safety or risk premium, war premiums unwound. Uh, the only thing that wouldn't be good for the market is if uh, treasuries were unwound, that flight to safety in treasuries. If treasuries really get a big safe haven bid on Monday because things have kind of exploded, that will send yields lower and that could do the same thing that we saw early this week and send stocks higher. So that's why I don't have a really good feel for what's going to happen early next week because I just don't know what's going to happen this weekend with Israel and Gaza and Hamas and whoever else might jump in the fray because of that. But what is important for the market is that yields come down. And if we just take a real quick look, probably going to be the last chart here of 10-year yields. What we see is the payrolls report on that Friday which sent the 10-year yield to a new secular or a uh, new cycle high, the highest since 2007. And then we see this pullback into the week. So this is the bond market closed for um, Columbus Day on Monday, but treasuries, our treasury futures were open and we had an implied 20 basis point move down on Monday. But if you look at the trend here, we have a lower low, right? We have a little bounce over here. We have another lower low. We have a bounce to a lower high. And we're down here along this trend line. So we still have kind of like a very short term downtrend in treasuries or a pullback in treasuries. If we do break below this trend line, and especially if we break below the 4.5% level on the 10 year yield, stocks are going to continue to rally. They're going to do well. If um, the safe haven premiums are unwound and yields head back up, then it's going to be trouble for the market. So this could go a lot of different ways. There's a lot of uncertainty into this weekend. And by the way, let me clear this chart real quick. I just want to show you one other thing. Like I said, that is the flight to safety into treasuries. So treasury prices go up, yields go down. We're looking at the 10-year yield here. This big jump 
on Thursday is the hot CPI report and then right here at one o'clock the dismal dismal 30-year auction which sent yields higher this kind of plunge into Friday again is treasuries being bought as a safe haven so Taking the uncertainty of what happens this weekend out, I don't know. I can't predict that. Um, all the other things being equal, we just entered earnings season Friday. We had uh, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, City, United Healthcare all uh, reported, and they were all taken pretty well. Generally, they are at the beginning of the earnings season, but we are entering earnings season. The market's going to be focusing on that. I'm going to tell you the market may react to earnings, you know, what happened last quarter, but that's not what's important. What is important is watch what these companies say about guidance for the next quarter or into H1 of next year. That's going to be really important. So if the market has the opportunity to focus on that and not Israel, it's going to do that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. A lot of good stuff in there. And uh, I hope you can put those concepts into practice and into use and they are beneficial for your trading and investing.